If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> and to do godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses this is the word of the lord thanks be to god from that reading you might think that we're going to be focusing on money but we're not <laughs> i don't know why people are cheering about that but we're not so if you've not been coming for the past few weeks, or even if you have been coming, I'll remind you because you might have fallen asleep during the last couple of sermons as well. So we decided for the next, well, for the next 10 weeks now to, to look at the subject of resilience, looking at how to develop personal resilience and how to develop church resilience, I suppose you're saying. So a fortnight ago, we started off. We had this Scottish guy talking about Anybody remember what he was talking about? No. He was Jesus! Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but focusing on Jesus was uh, the first step in building resilience. You know, we, we, we've had a, you know, when you're looking at trying to withstand the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, I think is how Shakespeare would put it, um, we, we decided to look at how, how can we stand against the, the, these troubles. So we said, focus on Jesus. I encourage you to do a kind of Jesus audit. If you remember, I talked about, you know, talking to Jesus, studying Jesus, reading about Jesus, singing about Jesus. Anybody get around to looking at that at all? And we only get over 10 minutes a day on that, on that audit. And then last week, uh, Frank talked about, and I'm going to give you a clue, right? You, the answer is not Jesus. Well, he, he did talk about him, but that wasn't, if we got one word, hope. You also remember Frank's better than mine. Uh, so hope, yeah, Frank talked about hope, but a kind of Christian hope, a life rooted in, in Christian hope that can build resilience. So today in our reading, we did find out what I'm going to talk about. And we're told in verse 11 to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Now you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to talk about all these words because it would take me two days. So I'm just going to focus on a couple of these words that we were encouraged to pursue and they are godliness and gentleness. But I do want to look at them in the context of what Paul was talking about. I'm not going to look at them in isolation. I do want to just mention one other word which we don't really talk about much in church at all is this word endurance was in that list as well so I'm not going to mention righteousness faith or love they're talked about quite a lot and will be later on in the series but this word endure it's often translated as, as be, be patient but the, the, the Greek word in this occasion is a bit more than that it's, it's courageous patience still being very positive and being strong Courage, endure courageously being patient 
in the midst of holding godliness and gentleness. Which is interesting that that word slipped in. And we'll come back to that a bit later on when we look at gentleness. So what is Paul's starting point when he's talking about encouraging us to pursue gentleness? Uh, sorry, godliness, sorry, to pursue godliness. And his starting point is money. He talks about it for like the previous eight verses. And it seems to be that there was a problem happening then which doesn't seem to have really changed in the past 2,000 years. You know, when you're trying to plan for the future, when you're trying to make yourself more resilient, able to withstand the blows that life might throw at you, what do you do? You build a big bank balance. That's what you do. You pursue money. And Paul says in her reading, the complete opposite. He says, flee, flee, flee what? Flee the love of money. Because it's the root of all kinds of evil. So Paul's setting up something here. He's saying, listen, don't do what might feel natural. If you want to feel protected, if you want to feel secure, if you want to build your resilience, don't do what would appear the natural thing to do, which is pursue money. Build up your bank balance. You know, when I was at Sunday school, I used to sing a song at Sunday school. I went, remember the song about build your treasure in the bank of heaven? Then they, it's an old one, Hedy. I mean, I'm surprised Angie remembers it. You know, you remember that one, Angie? You? Build your treasure in the bank of heaven where no thief can steal it away. I, I won't carry on. I won't carry on. But the sentiment was right, wasn't it? The sentiment was right. It's what Paul was saying here to Timothy. He's saying, if you want to build resilience, if you want to, to, to look at being secure you know, in your life, don't focus on money. Focus on godliness. And Paul talks about God as he mentions it, this word, it comes up eight times in Paul's writing. Seven times to Timothy and one time to Titus. So he only mentioned it when he's speaking to individual people. Godliness is not a characteristic that the Bible looks at with regards to a church. It's with regards to you as an individual. So what is godliness? Well, the best and most common definition that I found was it's living a holy life with deep reverence for God. A holy life with deep reverence for God. To be honest, it was the words deep reverence that kind of grabbed me. I kind of think, live a holy life. You know, as Christians, I kind of think, yeah, we all try and do that. We all try and, and live you know, a good holy life, being separated from the, 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 the evils that, that could, you know, and the, the, the weeds of evil that could, that could pull us, the roots of all different kind of evils. We kind of get that idea. But I had to question myself, and I want to ask you to question yourself. How do you get on with living a life of deep reverence? What does that even look like? What does that mean to you? If I was to encourage you, you know, if you want to build resilience, to live a godly, you know, a, a life of godliness, live a life of deep reverence to God. And I, I, I'm not going to go into massive detail now, but unpacking that, I want to encourage you to try and think, what does that look like for you? Living a life of deep reverence. Because Paul says in this passage to pursue that. If you want to, to, to build your resilience is that a word, resilience It is now. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to, to have security in the future, if you want to increase your bank balance, you know, do it by revering God. And he says this in the, in the, the following verse. In verse 5 he says this, Godliness is not a means to financial gain. 
Now, I don't think that many people in this church would think that, but there are Christians who think that if you're godly, then you'll be rich. And Paul says it in black and white here. Godliness is not a means to financial gain. It doesn't mean necessarily you're going to be poor, but it's not a passport for riches. Well, not, you know, gold and silver kind of riches. But what he does say is this in the next verse, in verse 6, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. So if you want gain, live a life of godliness with contentment. And I, I love that verse. I've always found it really, really provocative. These are the inspired words of Paul. These are the words that God put in Paul's heart. And he says, if you live a holy life revering God, it will be great gain. And he's comparing that to society's focus on building up your bank balance, on focusing on wealth. And Paul says, it's just the wrong way to focus. But then he says that, that last bit. And he says, so if you're worried about your future and, and you want to be more resilient, he says, do it by being godly and being content. Now the Bible doesn't talk a lot about exactly what that meant there. We've got to look at it holistically wise. But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's what the verse says. It doesn't just say godliness is great gain. Even though I would argue that godliness is definitely great gain. You know, you, you couldn't think it's not that, but he sticks in something else. Pursue, and when you're pursuing this stuff, pursue it and pursue contentment. I really believe that contentment doesn't come easy. I believe you have to fight it, you have to fight at it, you have to work at it, you have to strive Paul says in the verse, strive for contentment. But I tell you what, if we're looking at being resilient, living a godly, contented life is a great place to build that from, isn't it? But I don't want you to think that any of that is easy. Surprise, surprise. Just one minor point about money. We didn't read this, but read it yourself in verses 17 and 18. Paul doesn't condemn money. He tells people who have got money how to live with it, but he doesn't tell anybody not to have money. But he does tell us not to strive for it, not to focus on it, not to make it a God, not to get it in the way of your relationship with God and a whole lot of other stuff that Jesus says as well. You know, but, but don't try and think that from this passage, the answer is not to have money. The answer is, if you have money, you have it available for God to use. So that the second thing we're going to look at is this other word, this word gentleness. And this word gentleness is, a, it's not a word that's used a lot in common English, is it, gentleness? It's the same word that's translated in the Bible as meekness or humility. It's a, it's a Greek word, I'm not going to pronounce it right, but Christotnas, I've even gone wrong already, I'll try it again. Christotes, something like that. You won't remember it anyway, but I should have said it more confidently, should I should have. Um, it, but I, I want you to understand, you know, what this word meant then, because it doesn't really mean that now. And you may know this, and if you do, brilliant, if you don't, it will, it will be refreshed to you. It was used quite a lot by the Greeks, this word. And it was always described and attributed to strong animals that are brought under like a master's control. So Xenophon talked about horses that work together are more likely to stand quietly together. It's translated stand quietly in English, but the word is Christosis. It's this word of gentleness. 
Uh, Plato uses the word to describe a mighty and strong beast that could be tamed and fed by a man. Aristotle uses it to describe the easy-tempered and easily domesticated elephant. You know, as if the words, you know, easy-tempered and easily domesticated are always followed by the word elephant, <laughs> you know. But you can understand, uh, you know, that the idea of this, of this gentleness now is only used with strong animals that are domesticated or are, are trained, come under the control of a master. So it's used to dis only to describe strong people. A weak person can't be gentle. It's a strong person that has this, or could have this attribute of meekness or of gentleness. Meekness is, is a, an attribute that, that's a, a, a attribute that's, that's given to Jesus, isn't it? We, we use that word a lot when we were songs for Jesus. And it's a little bit like going back to two weeks ago. Surprise, surprise, actually, Mark was right. We, we, you know, it is focus on Jesus again. You know, if you want to understand what meekness looks like, what gentleness looks like, then look at the, at the, the creator of the world, Jesus Christ, who took on human form, took on the constraints of that, and came under the authority of God the Father. That's gentleness. That's meekness. That's humility. It's yielding to God. So we need to trust God, knowing that he has the best for us. We don't have to be self-reliant. And gentleness is not a, a fruit that you can steal from somebody else. It has to come up from the roots. And Paul uses that with, a, with the analogy to, the, you know, to good roots and, and bad roots. I read a quote that said, Pride makes us artificial, but gentleness makes us real. So if you want to build resilience, start from a position of gentleness, strength under submission. I read somewhere else that, that meekness is a posture of serving, not conquering. A posture of serving, not conquering. You know, gentleness <clears throat> is a powerful thing to aspire towards. I think especially in the 21st century, I think it's countercultural. In our century, to be looking at humility, meekness, gentleness. I read somewhere else that pride is the opposite of meekness. Pride is the opposite of meekness. And therefore, if we want to build um, resilience, we need to lose pride and work on gentleness. Because when these disasters come, which they come, <clears throat> they seem to be coming more often in the past few years, but when, when life, you know, sends us winds to knock us off course, we don't stay on course by having a big bank balance. We don't stay on course by being proud. We stay on course by being godly and by being gentle. But remember that gentleness is strength under the submission to the master. That humility, that meekness. I was reading Rick Warren last week and it's ridiculous how often Rick Warren speaks into my sermons. It's, uh, I should really just put him up, it'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? And he said this last week on this subject. He said, you've probably spent a, a lot of time trying to determine what you want to do in life but God is far more interested in who you are than what you do. You're not taking your career to heaven. You're not taking your bank balance to heaven. You're taking your character. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, this is still Rick Warren by the way, from the very beginning God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who would, should become like his son. God's plan has always been for you to become like Jesus. It was God's plan from the very beginning, even before Adam sinned. 
The fruit of the Spirit are the perfect picture of who Jesus is and how he acts. And then he quotes Galatians chapter 5. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. That gentleness is sometimes translated as a humility. So God does, so how does God produce this kind of fruit in your life? He puts you in situations that are opposite of the fruits he's growing in you. During periods of grief, you'll learn joy. You'll learn enduring patience when it's tested, which is the word that was also in our passage. So, <clears throat> Rick Warren is saying here, you know, it's when we have tough times that we have the opportunity to build resilience. You don't build resilience when things are dead easy. Trees don't grow strong without wind buffeting them and making them forced to put their roots down. And we need to put our roots down so we can cope with the buffeting. I better have done to my notes here. What did I say here? <clears throat> I've said here, God is not interested in your bank balance at the end of your life. It's your character. How Christ-like we are. How godly we are. How gentle you are. That's the true test, isn't it? I don't know how much you get on that test. But the good news is, we've got, our, hopefully each of us, you know, plenty of time to look at developing that test score. <clears throat> so in summary, we focused on two things today. And I thought I would put up a picture of a baby because, you know, we don't have babies all that often, apart from the fact that Rachel and Paul have got baby Lily into church. And that's, that is not a picture of baby Lily. It's not quite as cute as Lily, but I just thought to that I'd put one up for you because, you know, you look at that baby and you think, yeah, she's not got a care and the worry in the world. She's just, just content. And then the world gets, gets involved, isn't it? The world gets involved, the hassles get involved, the difficulties get involved, the wind blows, <clears throat> and the picture changes. But godliness with contentment changes that. So I want to remind you that meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength. Gentleness and humility are characteristics linked to strong people, strong animals. Strength under submission, Christ being our example. And the other thing I want to encourage you to do is live a godly, contented life. A godly, contented life. And I realise that that is a mighty ask. So don't worry if we have to keep on trying until we're 104. Or even as old as Karen. Yeah. Yeah. we just got to keep going at it. Keep going at it. And why do we do that? Because it helps us build resilience. It helps us develop the character that Christ wants us to be.